the main speaker, and um, what did it take to be a Lancaster pilot? Well, in this case, it, it was the usual pattern, uh, boys 17 or so, uh, making sure their educational standards were up to scratch by going to night school, um, getting into the Air Force, getting recruited into air crew, going through all the training programs, which included, of course, in the case of Western Australians, mainly landing at Cunderdon, learning at Cunderdon, and then going to England, going through the courses over there on the Oxfords and the uh, um, Stirlings and Lancasters. And our, our speaker today, to talk about all that and his experiences, I'm a lot of pleasure in introducing Max Bourne. Uh, hi. The trouble with us, the old blokes, when we get an opportunity to speak or write our memoirs, we, we tend to perpetuate myths make up a few of our own occasionally. And, uh, you know, things like um, the little girl pilot who single-handedly flew a Sterling. Well, I have one word for that. <laughs> Two <laughs> syllables, but one word. Um, the, uh, and the one about the group captain uh, station commander who rushed out to a burning Lancaster to help drag the crew out. The uh, photo flash exploded and blew the thing to pieces and took his hand off. And he's reported to have said, that uh, will someone see if he can find my hand because it's got a perfectly new glove on it. <laughs> Once again, too silver word. <laughs> but uh, well, the, the last one was about the, um, the coming back from Dunkirk, arriving at the station in England, and a journalist approached a young subaltern and said, "Well, tell me, Lieutenant, what was it like on the beaches?" And he said, "Oh, the noise and the people." <laughs> 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 anyway, I suppose I better get on with the other business that I can't do. <laughs> um, I've got a sheaf of notes here because when I start thinking, I start scribbling. I used to be organised better than this when I was 20. Beautiful aeroplane you see there. Was born out of a bugger of an aircraft, which is called the Manchester. Uh, in 1936, the Ministry of Aircraft Production put out a, uh, a request for uh, designs for a twin-engine aircraft, which could take a 1,200-pound bomb load internally, or one 8,000-pounder, or two torpedoes, and it had to be stressed so that it could be launched by catapult. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Avro uh, eventually came up with the design. Uh, Handy Page fell out straight away because they, they were wanting to use uh, Merlin engines and. The MAP said, no Merlins, we need all those for fighters. They only make 18,000 a year, Rolls Royce, and we need all those for fighters. And uh, the, uh, so this first flight was in 38 of the uh, first prototype. And the group captain, RAF, who flew it on its first flight, was back in 17 minutes. So obviously he wasn't enjoying it very much. He, uh, he found tail flutter, he found that the engines were way, way underpowered. The engines, incidentally, were uh, vultures, Rolls Royce vultures, which are in, in the process, developed, is the word I'm seeking. And uh, the vulture actually was an X cross section engine. The, the uh, favourite engine of the RAF for 18 years was the Rolls Royce Kestrel, the V12, with uh, about 500 to 700 horsepower, depending on whether you supercharged it or not. They put two of those, bottom to bottom, uh, on a common crank trace with a common crankshaft. And you had that four piston rods landing on the one journal on the crankshaft, so I can see why they had better bother with it. Anyway, it wasn't developing anything like the power it was supposed to. Um, it probably rushed it into, uh, into production, but they didn't want it. And uh, it was such a dead loss that uh, uh, Avro said, look, we want to use four Merlins. And once again, no, you can't have any Merlins. You can have a, a, a Sabre, which was a very good engine eventually, and finished up in some of those fighter bombers that used to shoot them up on the roads, shoot everything that moves after D-Day. Um, and the other engine was a, the uh, Bristol tailplane was modified. Now I had three, another one in the middle, because she had not enough directional stability couldn't handle the swing on takeoff, and even on those lousy Vulture engines. Anyway, the, 
the chiefs at um, Avro had a pal in Rolls Royce who was also one of the big wheels there, and he snuck four out the back door from Merlin's for them, in which they then they stretched the wing of the, uh, the other r rubbish aircraft, the Manchester, very cunningly by spacing the wing ribs three inches further apart, which stretched the wing 12 feet and put new wing tips on it. Uh, which did lots of good things. It made more room for fuel tanks, so the fuel capacity went up from from whatever it was, not much, to uh, 2,154 gallons. And the cladding, remembering that originally it was supposed to be uh, capable of being launched by catapult, they dropped that idea. Must have thought it was silly. And uh, so the cladding, which had been extra heavy to stand that inertia loads of being launched by a catapult, could be reduced in thickness, which lightened the wing even though it was 12 feet longer, it was lighter than the original. Increased the aspect ratio, which made it more efficient to win. Anyway, away it went. Uh, the top brass were invited to come down and watch this new aeroplane fly. And uh, the MAP bloke said, oh yeah, it's a beautiful aircraft, but we have all the way you went about doing it. You didn't ask our permission Not to uh, do this and that, you know. <laughs> so, they were told anyway. <laughs> so, the, uh, the, um, Merlin, the original ones they put on it had 11.30 horsepower on the prototype. As soon as they went, got to go ahead to, to build the thing, they uh, used the next Mark, Mark 20s, which had 1,280 horsepower. All useless information, but I find it interesting. <laughs> so it had a, a, a much improved range. The original aircraft, Manchester, could only get to 10,000 feet, which put you within reach of the light flak, the sort of stuff that my friend over here used to throw around. Um, Bofors and stuff like that. And um, uh, the range went from uh, from 1700, and, oh, from whatever it was, it was useless. Now it became 1730 miles with a full bomb load of 14,000 pounds. Of course, it reduced petrol load when you got a full bomb load. Or with 7 pounds, 1,000 pounds of bombs and a full petrol load, 2530 miles, which would made it fairly useful. Aircraft. Now this is, uh, when I talk about myths, that 22,000 pounds you see on the top right uh, wasn't for ordinary mortals like me. That was for the 617 squadron there with the dam busters and that 22,000 pound bomb was called a grand slam. It was called an earthquake bomb. It was a, a hardened steel, very pointy nose. Weighed, as you can see, 12 tons or something, 22,000 pounds here. Yeah. Now, that was supposed to burrow into the ground and then explode and wreck things. And it was originally intended for the, um, the submarine pens on the French coast. But uh, they found out that the concrete, which they knew, knew was fairly quick, uh, thick, I'm sorry, um, it was thicker than they thought. It was 35 feet of concrete as uh, most of those submarine pens. And the predecessor to that, there's the bomb, the uh, Grand Slam. Um, the, the um, bomb bay had to be modified. They cut the doors off uh, and slung it on a single sling with a couple of steadying things down out. And uh, took the front turret off, took the mid-upper turret off, took two of the four guns out of the rear turret, gave him 200 rounds of ammunition for each gun, and then all sorts of ways lightened the aircraft so they could carry that thing. And they still had to get that uh, 63 thousand pounds or what it was, 73,000 pounds off the deck, which wasn't easy. Um, the predecessor to that bomb, uh, that, that, that was the dam busting bomb. You remember it had a reverse spin on it so it would bounce and jump over the submarine nets and things. Once again, modified bomb bay, bomb doors chopped off here. Bomb, base, bomb doors start there and go back to there, 33 feet. Chopped off there and this thing installed. That's schematic, actually. The, the motor that rotated the bomb was up for it here a bit. But uh, all very ingenious. The, uh, as you know, uh, Guy Gibson got a BC for leading that thing, that parade. And um, that's the Grand Slam again. Let's go back to the, 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 the tall boy, uh, which was uh, uh, 12,000 pounds. 12,000 pounds, once again hard, and these did burrow up to 14 feet into the uh, concrete on the submarine pens, they found out later, but they couldn't get through 35 feet. The idea was to burrow in, then explode and blow the hell out of things, but uh, 
That, in fact, that bomb, or those bombs, sank the Tirpitz. First effort, they damaged a pocket, pocket battleship, yeah. And uh, they were very nervous about getting running loose in the Atlantic. And uh, the second go, they sank it with those bombs. Very nice. Thank you. Another Barnes Wallace development, the, uh, the Dambuster mob bomb guy. Now, the, the actual thing about the uh, Merlin engine, of course, it was its reliability. They just kept on going. They were a little bit more vulnerable to enemy action than the radials because of the coolings. You know, they had a header tank, pipes, a radiator, and a whole sort of any of those that make up the system a bit. Uh, I, the only times I had to feather a, um, a Merlin was uh, due to me, uh, due to, um, or it was enemy induced, if you like. It was uh, nothing to do with Mr. Rolls or Mr. Royce. Could take a big load. The engine's reliable, so the crews were very happy about it. And its first operational debut was on Augsburg, which is where they built man diesel engines for the um, submarines. And they sent 12 of those in broad daylight, to, at six from each of two squadrons. And uh, five got back. They lost seven of the 12. But the brass said, "Oh well, it was a worthwhile exercise seeing you destroyed the factory." So that's pretty good. Uh, the five that got back thought it was pretty good. <laughs> um, now, they were still worried again, well, once again, about the supply of Merlin engines. So someone came up with the idea of putting six Hercules, Bristol Hercules, which is a brilliant engine, the one in the Sterling and in the Bowfighter. The one that got the Bowfighter the name Whispering Death from the Japs. Um, 1,650 horsepower, uh, no cooling problems, um, and uh, how many of those were built? 300 of those by, were built by Armstrong and Whitworth and they all went to the Royal Canadian Air Force. 60% of them were lost. Incidentally, the RCAF was so strong aircrew-wise in, in the UK, they had their own group up north a bit. And uh, their um, contribution was terrific. They said that, well, they didn't have a big navy, they didn't have a big army, so they better do something with the Air Force. So they drove them and came over. And it's, I don't know whether it's one of those myths, but the story is that there were 25% of the air crew of Bomber Command were Canadians. Not just on Canadian squadrons, but like the Australians, we had three Australian Lancaster squadrons and one Halifax squadron, which is another four-engine thing. Uh, but most of us were scattered around amongst our air. <laughs> ah, here's a few airfields. Bomber Command airfields area here it was three group, which is where I was there located. That's three group, um, which covered all that area there. Uh, in Suffolk, um, eight group was pathfinders. Um, hundred group, they were specialist operators, mainly radio interference. So, uh, interfering with the uh, instructions from the Jerry ground control to the uh, to their air night fighters. And uh, then one would launch into a tirade of abuse. One of the Germans one time, and the English bloke said, "You could speak German." Said. There, that Englishman there, he's, he's doing his blocks of the business, and he said, I'm not the Englishman, I'm me. <laughs> <laughs> Five group had all Lancasters, you can see quite a lot of Lancasters. The two Australian squadrons, two of them, the um, 463 and 467 were there somewhere. Um, and the next group up there, one group, was all Lancasters. And at Bimbrook was number 460 squadron, which is a very famous Austra all Australian squadron. The ground crews were largely uh, UK, uh, RAF blokes, but uh, um, four group, I can't remember what the hell they had. I think they had Halifaxes. In sixth group, the Canadians had um, uh, 11 squadrons of Lancasters and s six of Halifaxes. Not bad for one colony. Uh, here we have the there there and there were all operational training units and conversion units. There were other training, this is only one command of course, you know, there were fighter airfields, there were uh, coastal command on the coast guys, um, all kinds, and bags of training airfields. So um, they reckoned that the uh, barrage balloons kept England afloat and I'm surprised that uh, all those aeroplanes running up their engines didn't push the place sideways. <laughs> uh, heading over the North Sea, which is uh, which we did a fair bit of, 
And you have to bid up some, head over somewhere order to get to the other people, the other side, the other people. There's the, you were looking for Edinburgh, Colin. Yeah. And we we're we're talking about down here. That's good. This is bomber country here. The Yanks incidentally were all in this area here and around here, but plenty of Yank drums. And um, so we would start off from here and uh, depends where you're going of course, but you had to cross either Holland or Belgium or part of France, which is all occupied territory and unfriendly, uh, to get to, uh, that's Germany, circled by red, as you can see. Uh, this area here, the Ruhr, the, uh, the, the bomb's called Happy Valley. I don't know why I was so happy about it, there were 300 anti-aircraft guns there. It was like a giant coal field, which was covered with industrial towns and cities, only one or two I mentioned there. Essen is where Krupps had their main plant, which was a huge plant. Uh, Frankfurt on Main, Frankfurt on Oder was over there near Berlin. Um, my fourth trip was on Frankfurt, and I didn't want to talk about me particularly, but if it makes you happy, I will. Um, my fourth trip was to Frankfurt on Main, and the, the uh, target was the Opel car factory. If you think Holden, think Opel. The, um, it was owned then and still is by the General Motors Corporation. And it was building Buzz Bomb, the V1, the Buzz Bomb, which was raining on London. Since about D Day, they rained these blasted flying motorbikes uh, into London every day. And uh, so we cleaned that up. But uh, it, was a, it was, I think, we only lost about 4% on that trip, but it was quite good from that way, but that point of it. Well, sorry, 7%. Um, the, uh, approaching the target and after leaving it, we were over a very uh, stratus flat cloud and some bugger, whether it was a fog wolf condor or the fighters themselves, they were dropping um, parachute flares which lit the joint up like day and of course we would stand out against this white so I used my brains and got down into the cloud and stayed there until I got to the coast. Happy Valley as they called it was a um, I think I did about half my trips on there. It was, uh, I, I was damn lucky actually. I had a, a very easy go because it was just after D-Day and we did a lot of work collaborating with the Army. It should have been the work of, of all, uh, the tactically, of course, the twin engine things, but uh, for some reason they wanted us to do it. Perhaps I reckon we might scatter a few more bombs around. But uh, so the, I, my first one, two, three, three trips were three hours, four and a half hours or something in France, which is, uh, which was quite comfortable really. Although, when I got to the squadron, the squadron commander um, said, oh, look, Lord, he said, uh, we're uh, probably dispensed with the second dicky trip. He said, we're doing some few daylights, so we'll probably put you on a daylight first and put you in the middle of the gaggle. We didn't fly in formation, it was a gaggle. A lot of aeroplanes are all flying in one direction. and. Uh, Anyway, two nights later, damn it all, I'm on the thing and away we go. And I'm on my own, with my crew, of course. And we worked out what those twinkles in the sky were. <coughs> that, was, that was flak, and we knew about searchlights. We'd seen those before. But, um, the, the good old Lank got us there and back, no trouble. A few little holes, that's all. The ground crew, when you got back, the first thing they did was have a good look around and see how many holes you've made for them to patch up. When um, the American uh, Packard uh, company started producing Merlins by under license. Um, there was no point in having the Hercule one anymore. So they scrubbed those after they made 300. And um, the Packard Merlins came on stream about mid-43. They were identical to the um, British made one, except they had carburetors and magnetos, American manufacture. They want to keep some of their money over there. Incidentally, something I've just learned is that in 44 and 45, the Ford Motor Company in the UK built 14 and a half thousand Merlins. Never heard of it before. I don't think that was one of the myths. Oh, look at that great bottle. Handsome looking blokes. Oh, you want to know about that? Yeah. Oh, all right. um, we crewed up at OTU. After doing Tiger Moss and Hansons here, went to the UK and flew Oxford, loved them too to get used to the flying in the lousy weather and to uh, be able to 
map read because there's so much stuff down there compared with here. But like flying out of Geraldton, there's one homestead every 250 miles. And no rivers, no railways, no roads, no nothing practically. But it was just overkill, I think, with the stuff you'd be. So we had to learn to find our way around the place and to find our way through their weather. So uh, after that, we went to um, a place called Wing, an OTU with um, Wellingtons, which is quite a heavy aircraft after the Little Oxford, uh, and uh, all, all different classifications, thrown into a big room and said, form yourselves in a cruise of six. This guy came later, that one came later, sorry. Um, so uh, this young fella here was a Perth bloke, 20, Roger Humphreys, rear gunner, great guy, terrific. Uh, Sydney, 23-year-old Paul Lambert Taylor, the wireless op, 20-year-old me, 22-year-old, oh, him, incidentally, I'm christened Arthur Maxwell born, that's me, Arthur Phillip born from Birmingham, that's how we got together, of course, no relation. Uh, this guy, the bomb aimer, was from Greater London, Tom Brown, bomb the Tom aimer, the boys called him. <laughs> and uh, the 22-year-old, still living in Adelaide, uh, met up again, Brett Heffern, another lovely guy. Um, so we did our OTU on uh, Wellingtons. The next station, Chedbury, was for Stirlings. They were using up the Stirlings on heavy conversion units, um, keeping their lengths for operational flying. But the Stirlings were being phased out of... Uh, in the main force, and uh, it was quite a step actually, the Sterling, but a very, very nice aircraft. Bit heavy, uh, couldn't get to hype of a decent load, but that didn't worry us that the uh, heavy conversion unit. Anyway, because it had 16 petrol tanks, or so for one very good reason, you needed a flight engineer, so we were allocated Bill Vincent, London bus driver, 36 years old. I don't know how he felt about the boy pilot, but he, uh, <laughs> he fitted in very well with the crew. As a matter of fact, he was the biggest larrigan of a lot of them. But, um, his daughter comes and stays with me. And she brings her husband, otherwise she could stay longer. <laughs> <laughs> she's, um, she's been three years, the last four years to stay with me for several weeks. But, uh, this is uh, the rear turret. That was um, Roger's office, as we called it. Um, you can see the four Browning 303 guns there. And if my memory serves me right, I could be, uh, they were 1,100 rounds per minute each. <coughs> you notice there's no perspex in the middle? Yeah. They reckon they couldn't see very well because if there was the slightest bit of anything on the perspex, it would put the breeze up them. So cut the perspex out, which meant that they were sitting there in uh, anything up to 60 degrees below freezing, freezing their behinds off. They had electric. Uh, uh, inner suits, electric booties and electric gloves. Um, but for the sake of it, I'm rear sat on the thing, they were rather cooking or freezing because it was either on or off. There was no uh, mid, mid point. My greatest respect for those guys who, I think just to sit there for anything up to 10 hours, let alone do anything else, um, deserved a medal for every one of them. There's a very nice picture of the lank and another one. Brian did all these pictures, and if he had another, there's a picture over a daylight target. That picture would have been taken by the, we had a four inch camera, which automatically took a picture, which was programmed, the camera to, the, the, the middle of the crosshairs on the picture uh, was where your bombs landed, theoretically, which is a way of them checking up to see how accurate the raid was, and whether you're telling fibs or not. Um, doesn't mean these bombs are going to fall on that guy because they would have been dropped way back there a bit. Uh, those white streaks on the uh, on the top of the wing are from the lead in the 100 octane fuel, the exhaust mm. there, and uh, so the um, lead made those stains. The lead also leaded up the plugs if you idle the engines at less than a thousand revs when you were taxiing around, etc. Uh, which meant using a lot of that bloody brake air and. Uh, that is one of their night fighters. Um, it came on the scene fairly late, and uh, Hitler wanted to do something else, make it into a bomber or something, so thank goodness. And um, most of the night fighters were, in fact, uh, ME 110s and uh, Junkers 88s. They 
showed us films during our training of um, how to, uh, the fighter would attack you. The fighter will come up alongside you to assess your speed, he will turn towards you, and then he will roll, and run his sights along your fuselage, and at the time he fires, he can't see you because he's aiming ahead of you, laying off deflection. Uh, now, it's when he rolls like that is when you yell to the pilot, corkscrew starboard go. This was later, of course, corkscrews, not, not at this, when these films were made in the 30s. And all that business about the, how the fighter would attack you, but the bloody Germans didn't get to see the movie. Because <laughs> <laughs> they didn't play fair, they didn't do that at all. Some bright side then on one of the squadrons got the idea, and they mounted two 20 millimeter cannon in the aft cockpit, or cockpit they created, I suppose pointing up a little bit forward, straight up and down. So from 150 feet away, below you, they could get under your wing where the tanks are, a couple of, few rounds and you're gone. And they were, we were, they were going down like flies, particularly during the Battle of Berlin. We weren't told about that, I don't know whether the, the experts knew it or not. We didn't know anything about that, but um, we would have loved to have got rid of that front turret on the lake and uh, Put one out the bottom. Oh, that's an operations board. There's a course sign. It's the 15 squadron. We had two squadrons at Milton Hall, which is a lovely peacetime station. Uh, the course sign for 62 squadron, which is mine, and the, the that's the station, and that's my course sign there on, on my mob. And that's me there, E. Mm. Off at 19:13 and down at 005. Take off 48 seconds spacing. Uh, for 39 aircraft. It's a fair number of heavy bombers have been up from one station. Uh, landing 1 minute 48 spacing. Um, this bloke, uh, Williamson, somewhere they said he crashed on the runway. He actually landed with his wheels up. He, uh, he was, they were a sloppy crew, nice guys, but sloppy. They finished up dead, uh, which had to happen because the way they, but uh, I think what they probably did was the flight engineer would put the undercard down, etc., etc., and the jobs he had to do. Instead of waiting for the word from the skipper, he would do it when he thought it was, you know, it was time. So when they came back from one trip, that trip, uh, and he was wounded and they had him laid out on what was laughingly called the rest bed, he, um, uh, no one put the undercarriage down. So they did a gutter on the runway and uh, had to change the runway, as you'll see. The runway changed. The Yanks just got a bulldozer and shoved it off. But, uh, this bloke, uh, oh, he's the one that crashed on the runway, Bill I think. Yeah. Oh, he landed at Woodbridge. Woodbridge was one of three on the East Coast emergency drones where the runway was more than twice as long as, as I with generous overshoot and undershoots at the ends. Uh, twice as wide as the regular runway, or well, three times as wide actually. And they had a FIDO, fog intensive dispersal log, which was a, some pipes running along each side of the, uh, the runway, which, in which they burnt um, uh, truck fuel, or whatever you call it, transport fuel in large lumps, and just melted the fog. It was pretty rough to land on that, Johnny. I didn't ever land on one. And they had a beam, of course, SBA. Here's a guy here, a hang up. That's meant he brought a bomb, bang, bomb back with him get rid of it, the thing had iced up, or the blokes had forget, forgotten to plug the thing, the cable in. Uh, uh, this bloke, he's got feathered, one of his engines anyway, and he gives his latin long, so that if he didn't turn up, the uh, yeah. SE rescue guys at least, then they have a starting point to start looking for him. Oh, well, theoretically they said 23 and a half thousand feet, I never get to past 22 and a half. Um, the only reason for going above 20,000 feet was uh, we were um, going for their their uh, synthetic oil plants. The facility had left. It was making oil out of coal or something, oil and petrol. And it was what actually led, I'd say, to the final the demise of the Third Reich was the fact that he couldn't run his tanks and couldn't run his aeroplanes because we'd bombed all his synthetic oil plants. And we had a thing called GH, the G-Box. Was I ever pleased about having a Jeep? I'm glad I was born when I was not a year earlier, because I most likely wouldn't be here. The things that blokes had a rough in 1943. Finding your aerodrome when you got back was always a problem. You know, 
hundreds of aircrafts coming around the bloody sky looking for uh, somewhere to land. Um, but the G-Box and uh, Arthur Bourne, lovely fellow that he is, um, could take you right, and you say, you're over the bloody control tower now on the G-Box. Wonderful. But the GH was a development of that. And when we got control of part of occupied Europe, we were able to develop, put stations, to make transmitter stations there. And uh, you could bomb accurately through cloud, through cloud. And the, uh, by the minimum height, the bombing was one foot per, foot per pound of bomb. Well, if, if you lost an aeroplane, you didn't want to lose two pilots. You lost all the crew. Yeah. No. No, no RAF. Well, the only ones that had more than one was the, uh, yeah. uh, with the bloody flying base where you got Sunderlands on coastal. And probably the, uh, they put some uh, B-24s on coastal too to control the Atlantic. Uh, they probably had a couple. So do you have someone that you had um, given some instructions? No, no, we've been encouraged to get our flight engineers to have a go, and my bloke wasn't interested. In no, no one else was. But we were, we were bulletproof. I mean, nothing was going to happen. Well, you obviously were. Yeah. 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 Actually, if we'd had any brains, when I say we, I mean the people running the war, they, they would have used um, mosquitoes instead of Lancasters. Loads of mosquitoes. Very few casualties because they could fight faster than the enemy fighters and higher and whatever. They could carry a 4,000 pound bomb, uh, which was equivalent to the weight carried by the Big 17. They had 11 guys in it for a 4,000 pound bomb load, and this, this other thing, that Muzzy had two guys in it. So it was more economical, really, wasn't it, to, uh, to, to run the war with mosquitoes. And uh, as a matter of fact, the Battle of Berlin, which lasted for about four months or something, Harris, the Air Chief Marshal Harris, Butch, it was called by us, um, convinced Churchill or someone that if he was allowed to uh, attack Berlin repeatedly, he would cause them to surrender, the Germans to surrender. No doubt. He said it would cost us mm -hmm. four or five hundred Lancasters uh, or heavy bombers, but he said it would be worth it. It cost a thousand and fifty actually. And uh, the Mosque, then we went and we decided we'd better give it up because on the last trip it was 68 or 78 lost. Um, shifted out. Well, I, fortunately, I wasn't started in this one, so I'm glad I wasn't born on 1924. Um, and for the next 36 nights, mosquitoes went with a thousand pound bomb each and bomb Berlin just to keep them on their toes. They still didn't surrender. They had no brains. <laughs> like, the, like the Londoners, they didn't surrender either. But the uh, they say, or they say, I don't know whether they did it or not, but it's possible for a mosquito to do two trips to Berlin in one night. Come back, refuel, reload, and change crew, and away you go and do another one. Um, particularly in, in the winter when the nights were long. Um, yeah, great aeroplane, and very cheap on crew. Yeah. Max, uh, how many gallons an hour were those one of those used in your window? I can't look off the top of my head, but I can tell you that if we didn't get 1.2 nautical miles per gallon, the engineering officer wanted to know why. Yeah. Um, so you can work it out, I suppose, from that. The, the load was 2,154. Not that you ever use it to the last drop. Not deliberately, anyway. But, um, How many hours were you allocated to learn the bomb? The Lancaster? Yeah. Oh, 11. <laughs> that included a three or four hour cross country. <laughs> I've got it here somewhere. That's what, that's what I wanted to tell you. Actually, I'm supposed to be talking about how to fly the Lancaster or something. Uh, there we are. Easy to fly. Three LFS, Lancaster Finishing School, 11 hours. MB, 20 years old, plus six weeks, 498 hours, total flying time. Uh, the usual route is John Taylor through Tigers and Ansons and Oxfords and Wilmingtons and Stirlings. And from the Stirling, they said, right, I'd go and go to fly this Lancaster. Uh, day one, familiarisation, two hours 15, dual of course, with the bloke in the white hand seat. Off you go, on your own, when I say solo, where the crew, that mad buggers, coming with me. Um, one hour 15 circuits and landings. 
day two, 15 minute check, just in case you've forgotten overnight. Uh, day two, away you go, 25 minutes combat manoeuvres, plush feathering, uh, once again on your own. The next day, 1.30 dual night circuits and landings, and one hour 15 solo circuits and landings. That was the total night flying we did there. Day three, fighter affiliation was when you had a friendly fighter attack you with a camera gun and your gunners would call the shots on the uh, on the corkscrew and you would throw the aircraft around and strain the hell out of it. Um, oh, and uh, that, that was 25 minutes actually. We took two crews and two lots of gunners up. Um, yeah, and the day four was a cross country, three hours, 50 minutes total. Night, two hours forty-five. Yeah, and it had no vices. The straw was a mush. Dropped us down a little bit. Nose a little bit. No wing dropping. Nothing like that. The c controls were light, except at high speed. But the only time they're doing high speed is when you're doing a vase of action, and you went to you, you seem to get stronger then. <laughs> <laughs> Then we went off on three days leave. Oh, I have to go to London, I think, to get some kit or something. Anyway, then to 62 Squad in Milton Oh, wasn't that a big station after those bloody missing huts? Oh. Peace time station, brick built, leather armchairs, and the opposite mess. Oh. You mentioned the tour, but what was your tour? The 30 trips. 30 trips. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, well, you, you did a tour of 30 trips, then you went and were rested. In fact, you were screened from operations, they called it. And my screening was to go as an instructor on a Lancaster conversion unit. And then you're supposed to go back and do another 20, but the war finished Thank in God. May, and my would have been going back in June, so. <laughs> so I didn't get me a medal after all. But, um, yes. Anyway, it was all good fun. I wouldn't have missed it for worlds. <laughs> yeah. Max. Yep. I believe we did read about the early bombing over Europe and that there was quite a number of planes that never ever been on the target. Ah, oh, well, the Germans wouldn't put any lights out. <laughs> no, no sweet times in the sky, I think. No, that was hopeless, actually, but uh, I can, you can understand it if you've never been up in the dark in an aeroplane. Uh, but the, um, uh, then when PFF, Pathfinder Force, which is yeah. an Australian bloke named Bennett, RAF than it was uh, devised, this um, uh, things got a lot better and uh, they would mark the target with flares on a parachute that would explode about the target and put a pool of red, green or yellow on the ground and uh, you'd be told, you know, bomb the reds or the yellows or whatever. I believe Eric Schubert was a pathfinder. Uh, no, he was a pathfinder wireless operator. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was Eric who introduced me to model on this because he was at OGU with us and he came when we arrived at 62 Squadron, his crew, or Ron Nelson's crew, and I were in the same truck. <laughs> and they did a number of trips, I forgot how many, with us as a regular squadron, and then got to the PFF. Yeah. And yes, I approached Rick, because I'd known him very slightly uh, before the war as a kid playing rugby, I think. And. Um, uh, Probably sold your pair of shoes. Ah, yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, Barney Silver and Company shoe store in Fremantle. Yeah. Um, and Rick, uh, I approached him about flying with me, and uh, he said, well, I've just signed on with this guy, Ron Nielsen, here, but I can introduce you to someone if you like. And he introduced me to Squizzy Taylor. Great. Good. You're a great pals. Went on leave together. Well, I'm going to go, folks. <laughs>